Welcome to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast, conversations with today's top ministry leaders to help you lead better every day. And now, podcasting from the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center in Chicagoland, here are your hosts, Ed Stetzer and Daniel Yang. Thanks for joining us in our Great Communicator series, where we talk with some of the top church leaders in the country about how to be effective preachers and teachers. This week, we're hearing from Pastor Andy Stanley. And he's a communicator, author, and pastor who founded Atlanta-based North Point Ministries in 1995. Today, North Point consists of eight churches in the Atlanta area and a network of 180 churches around the world, serving over 200,000 people each week. And he's the author of more than 20 books, and each month people access over 10.5 million of his messages, leadership videos, YouTube videos, and podcasts. But first, before we talk to Andy, let's go to Ed Stetzer, Editor-in-Chief of Outreach Magazine and the Executive Director of the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center. So Andy Stanley, we're, we're doing this whole series, this great communi- communicator series, to really try to help preachers and teachers um, have a greater sense of compelling and effective communication. Actually, we we use your book, Communicating for a Change, Seven Keys to Irresistible Communication. I give it out. Um, and so help me to understand what makes a message compelling for Andy Stanley? Well, so your audience knows you gave me these questions ahead of time and I love this question and I, I don't think I'm a great evaluator. And, and I say that because sometimes I'll hear something and share it with people. They're like, that was okay. And then they'll share stuff with me. Like, wasn't that great? And I'm like, no. <laughs> so <laughs> it is. So at the point being, one size doesn't fit all. And that's why you're doing a series like this, because one size doesn't fit all. So for me, here's what impacts me, preparation and passion. When a communicator brings both preparation, like they have really studied, their research is real. They're not just, you know, they just haven't pulled a few quotes out of the air. When I feel like they actually read the book rather than just pulled a quote from the book and they're they're, again, they're bringing enough information because I'm a learner. I, I, I love to learn new things. So with preparation and passion, in other words, they really, really care about the topic. And most importantly, I love it when I'm trying to listen at and listen to, because I think we listen to through two lenses. It's like as a communicator, I'm like, why are they so good at this? And then at the same time, I want to digest the content. When I quit evaluating and I'm just 100% drawn into the message because of the preparation and their passion, like I'm convinced this person really wants me to get this. And they're not going to be satisfied by simply covering the material. They're not going to be satisfied until they sense that I've gotten this. Those two things, to me, that's a win. And it's something I try to bring to my preaching. It's not enough to deliver true things. It's not enough to be excited about things. It's got to be, you know, I'm, I want to be passionate about the things that change people's lives or the things that have changed my life. So people, uh, we've been talking to other people in the series and your name has come up with the other interviews more than anybody else's. And often we're going to talk a little bit about introductions later. That's been a key theme, but you clearly craft. That's the language one person used. You're crafting messages, not just preparing messages. How, how do you think about bringing this together as a whole so that it is compelling to people? Well, I think, and again, these were such good questions. I, I I know what I do, and I think this shapes this. I think when a communicator begins with a topic or a what instead of a who, I, I think that impacts how they um, put put messages together, how they order messages, and again, where their passion points are. So, um, and the pressure, especially for for pastors, is, Hey, here comes Sunday, and I need to have something to say. So I'm, I'm, my my temptation is to ask the question: What am I going to talk about? What am I going to cover? What's the topic? What's the text? But the better question, if we can discipline ourselves to ask it, is: Who am I talking to Sunday? I'm talking to parents. I'm talking to single parents. I'm talking to seniors. I'm talking to to people who are struggling in their marriage. So if I can keep the who in front of me, and the who is a variety of people. That to me, that is that's probably one of the main things that helps me decide what not to keep in and what to leave in, mm-hmm. um, how to approach the text, how not to approach the text, how to craft an introduction, how to land the plane at the end. Because as long as there's a who years ago, uh, in fact, I think I referenced this in the book. Um, there was a communicator. We were backstage in a green room, actually, and I could tell he was one of our staff. He was so nervous. He was looking at his notes and, you know, pacing. And I'm like, hey, hey, look, look, forget it. Yeah, I want you to go out there as if your 18 year old son is giving church one more shot and they're on the back row. I want you to go talk to that kid. 
your son. <laughs> well, by the time I finished saying that, we both had tears in our eyes. I'm like, yeah. hey, that's it. That's the passion. Hey, you you got the content. Go talk to that kid on the back row who's given this one shot. And I, you know, one of the, the best things that can happen to me on a Sunday morning, and I'm sure many who are listening to this would agree, when somebody walks up and says, hey, my boss is here. Hey, my, I, hey, my sister-in-law, she finally said she would come to church with us. When I when I have just a little bit of biography around somebody who's sitting there that's unchurched or kind of on the edge or re-exploring faith, again, that who puts all the what, and I think keeps all the what in context, and follow Jesus through the Gospels, this is what we find, right? It, it always begins with a who, not a what. And when the what precedes the who, um, I, I, I think we miss opportunities. But for me, I think that maybe more than anything impacts how I organize or to use your term, craft a message. And, you know, you have been known for, I mean, there's certain, you've, since you've written on this and spoken on this so widely, people are familiar with, uh, you know, me, we, God, you, we. And, uh, but you, last time we talked, you'd actually, well, let, let's talk about that. Let's, you, you explain what that is mm -hmm. uh, and how has that changed and how that relates to a compelling message. Yeah. Well, so years ago, Reggie Joyner, you know, Reggie and several other, other of our staff said, Andy, we want to know how you do this. And I'm like, I'm not even sure I know how I do this. Mm -hmm. So they sat down and they basically interviewed me about this kind of like we're doing now. And in the process, I stumbled upon something that I've done intuitively that I'd never put words around. And I said, I think I do it this way. You know, what's going on with me? That's probably going on with you. What does God have to say about it? What should you do about it? And what if we all did something about it? So what's going on with me? So Sunday, I opened the message with, hey, let me tell you something about me. I hate to be told what to do, and I don't like to be told how to do things, and I'm not good at reading instructions. So that's that's the opening. And I said, I think that means I'm, and I put on the screen, human. And I said, how many other humans are in the room? So me, I don't like to be told what to do. We don't like to be told what to do. The book of Proverbs says we all need to be told what to do a lot of times. And the wise person is the person who listens to counsel. That's the God part. And then there's here's four things we can all do to be better listeners and to discern who to listen to. And what if what if we all got this right? So that became kind of the paradigm, the organizing structure. So it's not around three or four points as much as it is. What is here's something I'm dealing with. Here's something we all deal with. Here's what the scripture says about it. Here's what you should do about it. What if we all did something about it? And I don't I don't follow that meticulously because sometimes that same framework creates a series of messages, not just a single message. But that that um, simple way, me, we, God, you, we, me, we, God, you, we has become kind of a driver in terms of and, and two, like every communicator, when I get stuck <laughs> and we all get stuck, like I'm just staring at a computer screen and here comes Sunday. Um, oftentimes, if I will step back and say, okay, I've gotten lost in the weeds. Me, we, what does the scripture say about this? What do people need to do about it? What if we all did something about it? So that's uh, that's where that came from. Okay. And you mentioned how there's a point and you've been, you know, one of the key people, I think, for popularizing the idea of a one point message um, and being more effective than a typical, maybe three or four point message that my guess is that that's probably the way you learned at Dallas and uh, Dallas Seminary where Randy went to school. Um, so what, what, tell me about the one point message. How is that different than the three or four point and why is it so important to you? Cause it's been a recurring theme. Well, um, I, again, there's no one size fits all. So I right, don't totally. think it's better. This is just me. I think part of it is I can only remember one thing. Um, but I think as important is when I hear a four point met, and I'm not against it, but I, I mean, most of the time when I hear somebody say, and the fifth thing and the sixth thing, I immediately think, wow, that is a message series. You just used up a lot of good stuff in one week. I, you know, I would have, I would have taken each one of those points. If it's worth saying as a point, why not just preach a whole sermon around it? And again, you know, 25, 35, 40 minute message, most ideas, you know, most points are probably enough of a point to make the point of the message out of it. So again, different ways of doing that. So the other thing is, as you know, we've talked about this before. I'm assuming people aren't taking notes. I'm assuming right. people aren't going to go home and review their four or five points. Nobody remembers five points or four points. Honestly, most preachers who preach with points three weeks later, if you said, what were the four points? They don't know, but they can remember the one. So if I'm preaching for life change and if I want to make it portable and memorable, 
then just craft one really good statement and say it in such a way and say it over and over in such a way that people walk away with the point of the message. And um, again, it's a bit of a discipline, but uh, to me, it's easier. And I and I think it's easier to communicate it as well, especially when you're exegeting a passage of scripture and you're trying to draw the one thing you want people to be able to remember, you know, from that narrative or that um, passage of scripture. And I said exegete because the first time you and I talked, um, I was poking fun at a style of preaching, and it sure. branded me as someone who never exegetes the scripture. So, yes, to be I, fair, I, and I, unfortunately, <laughs> I, it, was, it, was, it was my it was a written conversation that we had, or a verbal conversation that I put in writing, and wasn't clear that you were joking, though you and I knew you were joking, and <laughs> yeah. and uh, yeah, that oh, well. wasn't uh, that wasn't well. That but we're still friends all these years later, Ed. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Um, so with the um, well, let's talk about that. I mean, the, the question was that that kind of came back to the question of expository preaching, because mm-hmm. um, we're in this even the great communicator series. We have people who are verse by verse expositors: uh, mm-hmm. uh, Ralph Douglas West, uh, Charlie Dates, um, J.D. Greer. You know, those are folks who are working mm-hmm. through tech books of the Bible. Yeah. Um, you even in your description, uh, you bring people. You know, me, we, God, or and that's where the text comes in. You bring people to the text. Whereas for others, they start with the text and mm-hmm. then they might walk through their points accordingly. Again, right. we're, we're recognizing, and you're, you know, your father, we're, you, we're, in the context of the interview we did years ago, you're actually talking about your father and, and you know, father's preaching is, is de- similar to going through books of the Bible. As you've kind of journeyed as a communicator, you've come to a place where one point where you bring people, you kind of bring forth the problem, do an introduction, bring people to the text. Why? that way because it's i mean it's obviously intentional and i mm-hmm. and i would say too i mean others a lot of people emulate you now but i would say you're one of the pioneers of that sort of approach so why that way well the other thing too is i generally and we're maybe talk about this in a minute i generally do series so i'm I've got on a topic and so if you're if you're in a conversation about a topic topics are sequential it's like let's start here then build and build and build and build. So consequently, the topics that I generally choose, there's not a book of the Bible about that topic. Uh, occasionally, there's a narrative that you can stay in for, for a topic. But because it's a topic and I'm building generally through a topic, I want to, here's the first thing about that topic. Here's the second thing. And not not every series builds, but most of them um, build. So consequently, it's like you know, it's like if I did a I did a series called Paper Walls about making excuses. And I could have taken all four parts of that message and and done it in one message and said, This is, you know, here's why we make excuses, here's why we make excuses, here's how to quit making. You could have it would all fit in a message. But why not take the things that you might put in a message and string it out over a series of weeks where you can say more about each one, but not feel like you have to say everything all at one time. So I think really preaching um through Preaching topically on top, uh, preaching topically within the context of a series, I think also is one of the reasons I've leaned pretty hard into that style. Yeah. So um, you mentioned series. Let's go there. Um, you tend to stretch your argument, not all the time, but regularly across multiple messages, and uh, and that's obviously intentional. And we've even talked about this in the past. But it often causes people to react to the parts while you're building your argument to get right. to the whole. So often. Often. So, I mean, and maybe you're intentionally doing that. Why do you do that? Well, I do that because the people who who take part of a series and pull it, when I say out of context, sometimes it's out of context of the sermon. Usually it is. But sometimes it's out of context of a series. But and this is this is hard for people to believe. They think I'm making this up. I really approach preaching like I'm a local church pastor, like I'm literally talking just to the people in the room or in the rooms of our our multi-site campus. So I'm assuming incorrectly, I'll admit, I'm assuming everyone watching is going to follow me through the entire series. I know that's not true, but because of online, because of, you know, the, the uh, internet, if they want to, people can go back and catch up or they can follow through a series. So I'm assuming the best in terms of how I want to communicate. So um, this past Sunday, we're, we're in a series and I preached primarily pulled extracted things from the book of Proverbs. So this was not a story about Jesus, a sermon about Jesus. This was not a sermon about the gospel. Um, so somebody could dive in and say, well, interestingly enough, if they dove in this past Sunday, they would say Andy only preaches from the Old Testament. <clears throat> but um, other than that, uh, they may get the idea that, oh, he's just doing feel good, um, positive thinking messages. The gospel wasn't in there. 
absolutely true if you isolate that one message from the series, you know, isolate that one message from the series. And I'm willing to take those hits because I'm not talking to the people who drop in occasionally to hear a sermon. I'm talking to a local church and a group of local churches that I feel compelled to disciple. And discipleship is a conversation and discipleship takes time over time. And so that's that's the approach I have um, you know, adopted. But I I totally understand people, you know, drop in and if they if you know if they already have some misgivings, um, you know, I I, I can uh, give them more and more evidence if they do that. But <laughs> that's just you know that's just the price you pay, I guess. It's an interesting time, um, you know, for a lot of preachers. You know, I was I was the uh, interim teaching pastor at the Moody Church in Chicago. Moody's famous for getting to the gospel in every sermon, yep. Yep. and um, I mean that's sort of like her Spurgeon, go to a beeline to the cross. But you don't do that, and you uh, intentionally don't do that. You explained a little bit why, but I want to I want to press in a little mm-hmm. a little more on that. So the assumption is is that people will stay with the course of the series. Um, what what what? How do you try to get them to do that? How do you? I mean, because again, you know, when, when we were in North Georgia, um, you know, we'd come sometimes on Saturday night, and there are always people kind of swapping in and out. So mm-hmm. how do you try to build the continuity in a world where people attend church once or twice a month and think they're regular attenders? Well, I. I mean, the, the question kind of is the answer. I just build continuity into the message. Hey, we're going to pick it. In fact, I've gotten in the habit, maybe a, a habit I'm too much in, of ending messages with, and we will, I say now, and we will pick it up right there next time in part three of whatever the series is. In other words, right. this is incomplete. We're not finished. Don't miss the next time. But I've given you enough to do between now and then to at least begin you know, moving forward with whatever uh, the topic is. And and the other thing too, and you know this about me, I really have such a heart for unchurched people. And so I, from time to time, want to put the wide, wide, wide end of the funnel out there for the person yeah. who's considering faith for the first time or reconsidering faith for the first time in a long time so that the there are the lower rungs on the ladder. I don't dumb things down. I don't pretend. I don't, you know, hedge our bets. In fact, I frequently say, hey, if you're not a Christian, this next part's not for you. This is optional. You can try this if you want. But if you're a Jesus follower, we, you know, we're under obligation to do this. So I'm constantly differentiating in in terms of who I talk to. And I've, you know, I've found that to be effective and the feedback is on that is pretty effective. So again, I'm, that's why I don't open up with, hey, let's, let's get, let's get back to the book of Ephesians to this week. We're in chapter four, verse three. That's assuming you have a Bible, you know, the Bible, you're just ready to go. And again, I that is a 100% appropriate way to preach and teach and lead a church. It's just not what I've chosen to do. And, and lots so. of hard work and preachers take that approach. <laughs> so, yeah. And yeah. we're for that. Um, yeah. the, but let's talk a little more about the, the unchurched uh, seeker, whatever term you want to use. Because because again, there are places, I mean, you and I, we, we've had lots of discussions. We disagree on things. We agree on other things. But one of the things I wish people knew about you, and not everyone can you know, have a conversation with you, but I wish they knew about you, just how driven you are by engaging people, uh, for engaging people who don't know Christ. Yet, um, and this isn't like a redirect here, uh, yet you don't seek to share the gospel because uh, most people who are evangelistically inclined mm-hmm. want to share the gospel each and every time that right. they can. So. Talk, talk to me, just explain strategically yeah. if we've kind of framed it and how do you share, invite men and women yeah. to receive by grace and through faith the good news of the gospel? Yeah. So um, what we try to do is within the context of a series to p- create that opportunity for people to understand the gospel for the first time, not necessarily in every sermon, but certainly in every series. But honestly, I preach mostly from the New Testament. And I am constantly talking about following Jesus, following Jesus, following Jesus, following Jesus. I mean, our our mission statement is to inspire people to follow Jesus. So the invitation to take baby steps or to take a next step to follow Jesus is there constantly. It's there in almost every single message, even when I preach from the Old Testament. So um, there is there's that theme. But what happens is, and you understand this, and I'm really not being critical, there are people who are looking for certain phrases. And if those right. phrases aren't there, it's like, oh, we well, are not evangelistic. Oh, you didn't share the gospel. Well, 
Actually, some of those phrases Jesus never uttered anyway. The Apostle Paul alluded to them. But again, follow Jesus through the Gospels. And again, when you begin with a who and you think who's sitting out there and where are they in their faith journey? And if the people in our churches are serious about our mission, they are inviting unchurched friends and family members to sit in church with them. And they are depending on me <laughs> to put the wide end of that funnel out there and to draw people slowly. And to me, the win isn't, oh, that person prayed a prayer and became a Christian. For me, the win is for the non-Christian and the skeptic to go, you know what? That made sense. You know what? I'm going to try that. You know what? That would make my life better. You know what? I had no idea that would, that Jesus is the person who said that. For me, those are all the breadcrumbs and the baby steps. And I, I'm i always going to err leaning that way as opposed to making every time. Sure, every time I you know preach a sermon, there's a, and you, know, you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. And <laughs> I believe enough <laughs> in the sovereignty of God to know that my preaching and teaching on its very best day is not enough to enlighten and enliven a heart. So I'm not discounting evangelistic preaching, but we all know there is a lot more to it than that. And the Apostle Paul even talked about, hey, the foolishness of preaching, but hey, God uses it and he always uses his word. So it is an approach. It's within the context of lots of ministry environments, and it's in the context of a series and rhythms in our organization and in the preaching calendar, because I approach this like a local church pastor. Yeah. And so at what point and how do you invite you? Because you mentioned, you know, someone could say, well, I, I could try that. I didn't know Jesus said that. And so there, there might be some behavior modification. But right. I also know that, I mean, you have a lot of people who come to faith in Christ there at North Point. Mm -hmm. Where yeah. does that invitation to yeah. that relationship uh, take, not not just where you're saying, hey, if Jesus said that, I could do that. I could, I could be a more forgiving yeah. person. But somewhere I'm taking that, those faith steps to be, be a follower of Jesus. Well, historically, where that happens more than anywhere is in our starting point groups. Our starting point groups are, are eight-week conversations for people who are exploring faith. And we are constantly pushing people, hey, to say, I'll say all the time, look, you have a question about faith that I'll never get to or that I can't answer, but we have an environment designed just for you. So if you are serious about learning, if you're curious, if you're trying to overcome an obstacle from something in the past and you just can't take that next step, or if you have questions you don't think I'll ever get to, please. So we're constant. So when we baptize people, um, probably 80% of the adults we baptize will reference starting point because right. that's where the lights came on from them because they were in a conversation where they were able to get their questions answered and take those next steps. From time to time, we give a full on altar call invitation, raise your hand, um, pray the prayer, repeat after me. We do that from time to time. So we, you know, we dip into all of those things. But again, it's within the rhythm of the church. Right. And, well, and that's probably, I guess what uh, I wanted to get at is, is that. Um, it's for somebody who's very driven on reaching people who don't follow Christ, your approach, which is deeply rooted in your approach to preaching, is I think different than many people expect I, to see for a church that's passionate I, about that. But that's an in, in, intentional choice on your part, and it's a strategic rhythm of the life of the church. Um, and it's, and, again, a, and may, it's one way of doing it. I Yeah, yeah, you know. I hear that. I hear that. People may, people may go in the direction, and that's fine. So one of the debates, which I think in a sense, you don't even have to participate in because of your approach, but the debate is in the broader conversation about preaching, am I preaching to Christians? Mm. Am I preaching to non-Christians? Yeah. And, uh, and I, I sort of know your answer ahead of time, but uh, <laughs> I'm what, preaching what is, to people. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So right. what is your audience and why does it matter? Yeah. So my, honestly, my, my first audience, I am believing that people in our church are taking a chance. They are risking their reputation. They're risking family Christmas being peaceful by inviting their friends and their neighbors to come sit with me. That's our big invitation. Come sit with me. And they know I'm not going to hardline the gospel. They know I'm going to differentiate in terms of my audiences. They know it's going to be practical, and they know there's going to be an invitation to follow Jesus because following Jesus will make your life better, and it will make you better at life. Following Jesus will make your life better. It'll make you better at life. Even if you take a baby step to follow Jesus before you know who he is, 
because that's exactly what happened in the Gospels. Jesus invited people to follow him before they understood fully who he was. So I, that is, we set that out there over and over and over. And again, depending on who it is, depending on their background, um, those baby steps and those breadcrumbs bear fruit over time. Okay. And um, even in your answer, in all of your answers, you use like, you have phrases that I mean, I've heard you use before. They're your go-to phrases on certain things. And when you preach, you use sticky statements and um, they seem to have, uh, and paraphrases. You know, these are things that you've talked about to drive home a point. Um, for those who maybe aren't naturally gifted in that area, how did you develop that skill? How are you, I know, you know, of course, you talk about this in Deep and Wide. You're raised in a very different context than almost all of us. But how did you develop that skill and how would you encourage others to develop some of those skills? Well, I love talking about this. So we have, you know, 10 churches in the Atlanta area and a network of churches. So I'm constantly listening to and help evaluate um, sermons and sermon outlines, messages. And so all of our, you know, all of our communicators, um, student ministry, middle school, people on our staff that, uh, you know, communicate occasionally, all of them have leaned into trying to figure out these bottom lines, these sticky statements. And what I've learned is some people are better at it than others. Some people who are good at it are not good stage communicators, but we've learned to, to collaborate around, hey, what's a better way to say this? What is a shorter way to say this? What is a Where can I add more rhythm to these statements? And so it's been so fun to watch over the years. Uh, men and women who don't naturally go there realize I'm not finished preparing my message until I have a couple of statements that I think are going to stick. And if they can't figure it out, they're open to asking other people to help them figure that out. But honestly, Ed, I, I think a lot of it, it's not intentional laziness. It's part of the, the um, sermon preparation process. You can finish an entire outline and have an introduction and a conclusion and think I'm done. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have that, I hate to use this terminology, kind of that phrase that pays that, oh, my gosh, that's that's what I, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking about getting in a small group and I made the I put on the screen. Um, co um, content consumption is no substitute for community. Content consumption is no substitute for community. Well, it took a while. I mean, you know, I, I wanted, you know, what's the thing I'm driving home? Because people are like, oh, I watch online or, you know, I'm like, yeah, watch online all you want. But you know what? Consuming content is no substitute for community. Life change happens in community. So sometimes I think it's just a matter of saying, you know what? I thought I was, <laughs> I thought I was finished preparing this message. I'm not finished because my bottom line is a long sentence or it's two sentences or it's a paragraph you know, what's that thing? And I think most people who have the wherewithal to, to put together a sermon and are creating sermons week after week after week, they have the ability to come up with that phrase. But it is sometimes it's time consuming and it's agonizing. And honestly, as you know about me, it's why I work at least a month or more ahead yeah. on sermons, because I'll be finished, set it aside. Three weeks later, it's like, that's what it is. I'm driving, I'm driving somewhere or I'm reading or, you know, how that, that happens sometimes. So a lot of it is, I think is, is just some discipline. Yeah. When you, if I were to look in your notes, um, do you have those sticky phrases? You know, for me, I italicize them and bold them. So I, cause I come mm -hmm. back to them. How, how yeah. does it look like in your, in your, when you're preaching? Well, they're going to be up on the screen, the plasma yeah. sitting there right beside me. Those are the things I want sitting there. So people not only hear it, but they, they oh, you actually it. put the phrases up so people oh, see them and say along. That's oh, right. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that's right. And and in your notes themselves, though, do you do you work with notes? Do you work? Do you? How does that work for you? What I do now is not what I did a long time ago. Okay. Now I manuscript my whole sermon, and I basically have a you know courtesy. Uh, people call them courtesy monitors. I call it right. a cheat sheet. You know, I just there's a big right. <laughs> screen in the back because I don't want to pulpit between me and people, yeah. and yeah. I. You know, I and I'm using the screen with the text, and I like and and you know, again, I like it when I hear see people preach holding a Bible. I just can't yeah. do that for a variety of reasons. My eyes, people have different versions of the Bible. I really don't want people pulling up their phone to look at the Bible on a phone when I'm preaching, or to you know. So I've just opted for the text goes on the screen, my notes go in the back. So I've got. And so when I, if I, I use look, more, do what? Uh, Doug, you go ahead. Well, I, I use more notes now than ever. I'm almost 100% scripted. And right. um, during COVID, I 
you know, I record pre-recorded messages like so many people did. And I just preached from a teleprompter for a year. I just, wow. I mean, completely manuscript yeah. it, put a teleprompter in the back of the room and basically practice reading the sermon in such a way that it didn't look like I was reading the sermon. I mean, I really, really worked at this because I, I wanted it to be precise. There's nobody in the room, so you don't have that wonderful dynamic. Um, so that was a kind of a skill I developed in pandemic. And I don't use teleprompter anymore, but I have yeah. plenty of notes. Well, and I'm surprised at how many of in the Great Communicator series have been like full manuscript people. And um, it's just, and so, but if I were to, if I were to come up to the front and turn around and look at what you're looking at, you're saying it's each and every word just kind of right there and, and almost okay okay yeah I mean and, it's 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 bullet points and phrases but it's right it's it's a lot yeah the and your sticky phrases in the studio with me today could tell you it's yeah, a lot <laughs> it's a lot and the sticky phrases do they do they just kind of flow in there or do you come back to them I'm just thinking in terms of your notes how do you make yeah. sure you get to those sticky phrases or it's just natural because well, it's in the it's document? just they're they're where right. I want them to be and. And, and again, if it's something I'm trying to land the whole message with or something I want to come back to, it's yeah. yeah. And, and it depends on the message, too. Right. Yeah. You know what what the goal of the message, is, especially if we're going to pick up here next week. And so. Right. Right. That makes sense. Um, the well, you, you kind of hinted at your sermon preparation has changed uh, from when you first started preaching. What mm -hmm. have you kept all these years and what have you left behind? In terms of what ends up in the message, I don't know that it has changed that much. I love, love, love when I was able to switch to using, you know, having a plasma or we, the OLED now on stage because I, I really love exegeting scripture. I mean, if I, if I could just get, I would just so enjoy stand. I mean, I've told Sandra this thousand times. I would love to just get up Sunday and turn to Romans eight and say, let's all turn to Romans eight. There's therefore now, like right now in your life. I mean, I could just go and go and condemnation. I'd watch that. And do, do, well, <laughs> I would maybe someday I'll just, you know, do a Tuesday night Bible study. And there just you go. Do that. Because I, I would love that. I so love the text. Yeah. And so the fact that the thing about the screen and putting text on the screen and be able to highlight words, only show the parts I want them to see, build, um, go back to. Sometimes I put fake words up. Here's what we all think he's going to say next, you know, but here's what he actually said. Being able to to you know, leverage some creativity in terms of how the text is displayed and when the text is displayed. You know, I've just, to, to me, that is better. It, 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 it become a tool, becomes a tool of exegesis because I'm able to draw people into the text because yeah. the end of the day, and we've talked about this too. I, I, I know this is idealistic, but I would love to think people a week later could pick up that text in their Bible and go, Oh, I know what that means. Right. Oh, I know, I know what Jesus meant by that now. Oh, I, you know, I never understood that till, but from now on, when I, when I see that verse, I'm going to see it differently because of, you know, what I saw at church. So, and that means less text, more in depth. One of the things I tell our communicators, the, um, the, the biggest mistake new communicators make in, in my experience, when I say, and I mean young communicators, I should say, is they're great about their personal story. They're pretty good about the application, but their energy generally dips when they get to the text. And so when I'm doing evaluation, I say, I want you to watch your message and I want you to, here's the notes I want you to take. I want you to tell me where you, you had the most energy, the least amount of energy and why. And 90% of the time in those early messages, they lose their energy in the text. And I say to them, look, you've got to bring your best energy to the text. And if you can't bring your energy to the text, you're not ready to preach and you haven't finished studying because the text is the point, not your cool story about, you know, the fishing trip and the dog and, you know, all those wonderful things that, that are so fun to talk about. Figure out how to bring your energy to the text. And so, Again, that the, I feel like the text should be the most in the the uh, the most engaging um, and you know the best the best part of the sermon. So, but that you know that that takes a little effort, and sometimes it means less text with more energy. Okay, and your I mean even following your pattern, you're bringing people to the text and then walking them uh, with you know application or, or something something changed because they encountered yeah. the text. Um, when do you think that you've successfully done that? What is like, this was what I, I'm sure there's times when you say it didn't go, uh, when do you yeah. say this has been a successful moment to bring them to and engage that text? Come back to that. If I don't answer it with this about, oh, I don't know how long ago I started writing three questions 
um, that I add to almost, well, really to every sermon. And when we present these uh, on a Sunday has changed from time to time because of the way we do multi-campus. But I decided to, to the point, I don't want people to go, oh, that was engaging or, oh, that was inspiring. So now I create, I, I create three questions. I put them on the screen right after the sermon. And I say, hey, I want you to keep this conversation going at home. I want you to keep this conversation going around lunch. If you're watching from home, I want you to t- right now take these three questions and talk about them at home with whoever you're watching with. Again, in an effort to say, let's do this. Let's think about this. Let's process this. So sermon's over. I pray. And then, hey, three questions. We'll put them on our social media sites. There's a QR code, you know, just anything I can do to keep to keep people engaged with the content. Because again, doing is what makes the difference. Jesus said that anybody who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, you know, might as well not have been here, right? It's like a you know foolish man who built his house on the sand. So um, I don't know the answer to the question in terms of how I know people have gotten yeah. it, but I am committed to doing whatever I can right. in my power with whatever creativity and time I have to just try to push this into their lives and into um, real world application. Yeah. It, it, someone said, speaking of your preaching, said that then Andy tries to elongate engagement. That's a key way they described it is, is like, here, you could just go and experience this 30, 30 something minute message. And he's like, no, we're going to continue it. We're going to elongate it next time. We're going to elongate it with other questions to try to get you to marinate over the, the text and the point that is there as well. Now I've heard you say that presentation trumps information when it comes to engaging the audience. And a big part of what we're talking about in this series is compelling communication. Um, so how do you strike a harmony between a compelling presentation and really making sure the information is, is is helpful, biblical, accurate, and more. I think it goes back to what I said at the beginning. It's preparation and passion. All yeah. preparation, you know, having all the right stuff without passion yeah. is boring, even if it's true. All passion without any meat, without any content, it's exciting. But then, you know, we've all sat through messages that were so engaging, but I couldn't tell you for the life of me what the person talked about, totally. or what they wanted me to do, or how the text had anything to do with that, but it sure was interesting. So um, the uh, the presentation oftentimes is what makes inter- is what makes information interesting. Um, the only person that doesn't have to be engaging is your doctor because you're real interested in the information. But other than that, if the presenter isn't somewhat engaging, even the most life giving text can come across as dead and boring. And as Dr. Hendricks and seminary used to tell us all the time, the worst thing you can do in the world, the worst thing you can do is to bore a child with the word of God. I mean, he told us that a thousand times. The worst thing you can do is bore a child. In other words, the word of God is the word of God, but don't make it boring because the lesson to a child is the Bible's boring. Faith Faith is boring. I don't need it. So again, it's passion and it's preparation. And then it's just the hard work of how do I say this in such a way that people get it? It's moving and it's portable, memorable, and they know what to do with it. And it's, it's, you know, they said you've done this all, all the time for years and years. It's just, it's not easy. In fact, um, I may, I don't know if I've told you this. So my dad's 89 when he was 83 or four, he called me one day. He said, Andy, he said he was still the pastor at First Baptist Church of Atlanta. He said, Andy, he said, you know what I want to what I would like? I said, what, Dad? He said, I would like to find somebody who's a little further ahead than me and ask them some questions. I said, Dad, I hate to tell you, you, you're the last man standing. I don't know any 83 year olds that are still pastoring churches. I said, but I said, but what would you ask them? And this is what he said. I would ask them if it ever gets any easier. Oh, wow. And he was talking specifically about preaching. He was sitting at his study, studying, and I called him and we were just chatting. And his point was, you know what, if you're not content, if if you're not content to just pull something out of the file and re-deliver it, if you really want to show up on the weekend prepared with something fresh to say, it never gets easy. That's from my dad at 83 years old. And I said, dad, do you... (laughs) Do you know how discouraging that is? Yes, I didn't think about it that way. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's like wow. But he's right. He's right. Yeah. If yeah. if you know if we take this calling seriously, that's why I say I wouldn't wish this on anybody. If God yeah. has not called you to do this, do something else. Because no matter how successful you are, no matter how well known you are, here comes Sunday. Here comes Sunday, and yeah. here's the who. Here's the single moms, the people struggling with their finances, the people with prodigal kids. The prodigal kid is going to give you one more shot. And if you don't show up with passion and preparation, 
you're a bad steward of what God's called you to do. And that weight, you know, that burden, as my dad would call it, whoo, you know, it's a, it's a big deal. Powerful, powerful. Um, and I was going to come back to the who, but you did. And I like that because I think that's a key part of what I want people to hear from our interview. Um, but one of the things that other people have mentioned, even in this series, is you got to talk to Andy Stanley about his introductions. And um, and it's it's funny because more than one person, even in the great you, people who listen to the full series, they'll they'll hear people mention you. Um, so how do you plan that? How do you craft that introduction? Well, about. I don't know, three years ago, I started doing something a little bit different, or I went back to something I used to do, then quit doing it. And I learned this from Gary Smalley. Do you remember Gary Smalley? I do, yeah, yeah. Yep. Gary would talk about salting the beginning of a message. He was a master communicator. And by salt, he, he meant you need to make people thirsty for what's coming next. Mm -hmm. So I have, in the past two or three years, begun my message with a tease about what's coming up. And then starting the message. So I'll start with like, like, well, this Sunday, like I talked about, hey, I don't like to be told what to do. I can't read directions. It's why I can't cook. Uh, da, 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 da. And, um, and then I ended with, and so when, you know, somebody mentioned premarital counseling, when we were engaged, I thought, I don't want some other guy telling me how to run my marriage. Besides marriage, how hard could that be? You know, everybody laughs. And I said, but we went to premarital counseling and I'm so glad I did. And Sandra's really glad I did. Today we're in part two, and then I introduce, introduce the message. So I've put some, I've left some tension out there, out right. there, like, oh, don't want to be told what to do. Nobody likes to be told what to do, and just let it hang. Then begin the message, and then of course the message circles back around to that tease up front. So I've got in the habit of doing that, you know, pretty often. And part of that, Ed, part of that is because um, we're on about thirty five um, in thirty five areas of the country right after Saturday Night Live. In those first two minutes, if they don't create some tension and grab attention, boom, you know, we're, we're on to the next channel. So I, th I began thinking that way or going back to that with that audience in mind. But, hey, if you got somebody, you brought somebody to church for the first time and you're praying, oh, God, help Andy to be good today, to start off with something that's, again, it's a bit of a tease. It's a bit of a, right. oh, yeah, me too, me, we, me, we. It's, you know, it's just effect an effective way to you know, introduce a topic or tease a topic before you get to it with the text. And you mentioned that you circle back to it at the end. I mean, that's been a real hallmark is that I sort of know when you tell a story, there's going to be more to the story to come. And and I think that's a, you know, that way that narrative weaves together is powerful. Yeah. How do you plan that out? Is, is that, do you have that? Like, I know it's in your manuscript, but there are strategic times you're bringing that story back. How do you do that and why? I don't know a good answer to that. It's, you know, the, the creating a sermon for me is a journey. And I just, you know, sometimes you just commit to the journey <laughs> before you know how the journey is going to end and you just hope it ends well. And generally it's in the process. Yeah. Um, I figure those things out, but there is, there is a pattern definitely. Right. And it's, you know, create the tension, create tension as soon as possible, get the question out there as soon as possible, get the mystery out there as soon as possible, whatever it is you're going to solve, answer or resolve put that out there as soon as possible. So for number one, people know what you're going to talk about. And the moment anyone in the audience, Christian or not, thinks to themselves, oh yeah, me too, or I don't know, or you know what, I have the same question. Well, to some extent, you got them. Now, you got to keep them, but yeah. you know, but look, and the best example of this is read the introduction to every single one of Jesus' parables. The introduction to every single one of Jesus' parables, he created a tension around something everybody in his audience understood, and he had them. And then, mm -hmm. again, he resolves it uh, with the teaching of the parable. So I, none of this is original. Uh, it's just it's just a style, and it's just something I think everybody can do if they decide to do it. Solve, answer, resolve. You've said that a few times. I think those are helpful words. Solve, answer, and resolve. Uh, last question. Um, you know, people are listening because they want to be more effective communicators. And, and part of the, as I would go through the series, part of the challenges is, you know, what Beth Moore has articulated is, is very different than what Rick Warren articulated or, or whoever else it may be. And I might, and even we were talking to Max Lucado, I'm like, you know, you can't, I mean, Max Lucado is just unique in just that communication approach, yeah. but there are things that we can take from everybody and learn from everybody. What advice would if Andy Stanley, from Andy Stanley's perspective, say, here's my advice to you on being a better communicator. And again, I would remind people that one of the things you can do is to get communicating for change, seven keys to irresistible communication. But what would that advice be from the heart of Andy Stanley to be a better You're going to hate this. Please tell my me. My advice is you have to watch yourself. Okay, good. You'll, as uh, you know, 
I think I've told you that story, so I won't bore your audience with it, but you, you'll either quit or you'll get better. Yeah. I mean, nobody, I mean, we're all our worst critic. Just watch yourself. Now, I don't, I think there's other things you can do, but the person who says, oh, I can't stand to watch myself. I have said to them, it's possible other people can't stand to watch you either. So you, and the thing is every, and this is, I'll shut up after this. Every message gets evaluated by everybody in the audience. So you are either learning from evaluation or you're not. There's no question about it being evaluated. So you either create create some formal evaluation process with other people on your team or you don't. But if it's not being evaluated, uh, Dr. Hendricks, again, he said, experience doesn't make you better at anything. Only evaluated experience makes you better. Experience just creates a rut and, a, you know, in some cases, bad habits. So there has to be there has to be a review mechanism, either with a team or, or I should say definitely with a team to some extent. But you got to watch yourself and listen to yourself and you will fix all those things because it's just it's just too humiliating to think, oh, there's no way I'm going to go out and, and do that again. So those I mean, there's there are other things besides that, but evaluation is what makes you better. Andy Stanley, thanks for being a part of our great communicator series. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ed. You've been listening to a conversation with Andy Stanley in our Great Communicator series. You can learn more about Andy at andystanley.com. Thanks again for listening to the Stetzer Church Leaders podcast. You can find more interviews as well as other great content for ministry leaders at churchleaders.com slash podcast. And again, if you found our conversation today helpful, we'd love for you to take a few moments, leave us a review. That'll help other ministry leaders find us and benefit from our content more easily. Thanks for listening. We'll see you in the next episode. You've been listening to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast. For more great interviews, as well as articles, videos, and free resources, visit our website at churchleaders.com.